David Dulio joins us. He's a professor of political science, Oakland University, and the director of Oakland University's Center for Civic Engagement. David, thank you very much for joining us here in the Megacast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So you had a little bit of opportunity to hear um, the previous conversation. You got two people, two groups of people in the state of Michigan that are having difficulty getting their unemployment checks, just people who filed. And there were, what, a million filers. So we're understanding that that's going to be difficult. It doesn't mitigate the pain for those people that have not received their unemployment checks. And then, making matters even worse, Kurt Lawson of the West Bloomfield Police Department confirmed in West Bloomfield alone, right now, their detectives are working on 20 unemployment fraud cases. That's one small community across the whole state of Michigan. As a result, the state of Michigan's action is to suspend unemployment compensation to 350,000 people around the state as a fight fraud. It's, uh, you know, certainly a direct approach to do it. Uh, we could debate whether it's the right approach to do it. But, but David, that's one of the many issues that we're um, facing right now. And it, it's got to be a fascinating time to be following state government. Well, it certainly is, and and you know you bring up a couple of the most brutal instances or most brutal examples of the the problems that that the state government is facing, right? And and it it's almost like it's a never ending list of things that are being impacted and uh, influenced by by COVID nineteen. I mean the the unemployment issues that you raised the the initial. Uh, difficulty of folks getting access to uh, the benefits that they have coming to them, and the uh, boy, if, if there's a million filers, it's and 340,000 potentially fraudulent cases. That's a third, right? A, a third of the of cases potentially fraudulent. That's just a brutal uh, hit for for hundreds of thousands of of people in our state. You know, and I read this morning too that uh, coronavirus is having a big impact on. Uh, the well, the small amount of funds that we were really going to have to uh, put toward the roads um, in our state, right? I mean, uh, the the with people stuck at home and not being able to drive, they're not going to the gas pump, they're not paying gas tax, uh, which would fund those those uh, road repairs. Um, certainly not to the extent that that we need it here. And uh, people haven't forgotten how bad our roads are. Um, but it's another example of how widespread the effects of COVID-19 are here in Michigan. Well, it's having a, a huge impact on all of us. And let's just talk political here for a minute, because that's that's your uh, your beat and, uh, excuse me, and mine to some degree. And and I don't like to get into right and left political. I we're, we're, We talk, we don't do that here on the show, but it's fun and interesting and helpful to talk about what is going on in, politi- in the political sphere. Is um, is there a battle right now in the state of Michigan, a political battle uh, for the hearts and minds of Michiganders? And is that part of every issue where the Republicans are hoping they're going to come out the big winner? The Democrats are hoping they're going to come out the big winner. And is that part of what is going into every decision that is being made and in Lansing and around the state? Well, I don't know if it's if it's part of every decision that's being made, either uh, say in the governor's office or in the legislature, because um, I'm not inside the the heads of those individuals. But uh, you know, I would say that um, you know, as an observer and analyst, it everything is political. Right? I mean, there's uh, and and I think there are a couple of factors that are ratcheting that up for us here in Michigan. One is the uh, and and you know this very well the the uh, increased polarization, almost historic levels of polarization that, that we're seeing where both sides, right and left, are, are in their corners and they're not coming out. They are, they're dug in and everything that comes up, whether it's unemployment benefits, road funding, that was certainly the case before, but uh, 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 the nursing home policy that's in effect gets layered over with polarized politics, right? And uh, another factor that ramps it up even more is the fact that it's in a, in, we're in an election year, right? 2020 is a big year. And 
there's more at stake now, say than in 2019, or there, that there will be in 2021, just because of the, the fact that we're gonna go to the polls in uh, November. And everybody knows that Michigan is a really crucial state uh, for the outcome of the presidential election. Yeah, and it's, it, that's even ramping it up more. You've got the legislature, the Republican-controlled legislature, been battling with the governor all the way through the coronavirus case. And then yeah, you that, got— That's go a really good point, right? I mean, that, that's a divided government, right? We're, we're in that situation where you've got one branch of our elected um, uh, offices controlled by the Democratic Party and one, and one branch, the legislature, both houses— uh, controlled by the Republicans. So that just makes the, you throw that into the mix and it, and it makes it even more, uh, more polarized. Uh, some might even say more toxic. Yeah. And, and then certainly uh, complicated by the fact that the president really is concerned about Michigan. It's, uh, it was a key state in his victory last time. And if, if he expects to win again, it's going to be a big state. He's been really critical of the governor. Our governor is on the short list of vice presidential candidates, possibly. So, uh, you know, he's been saying that woman in Michigan, and she's been poking back at him at every opportunity. So, um, you know, we try to set all that aside. And none of these people's jobs are easy, but it is fascinating to watch all this. And, and I just hope that it's not getting in the way. You know, what is interesting as we look at hyper local politics, it seems that about the last place that we're not seeing as much highly partisan activity. It, if you go to your local city council meeting, you might even have difficult, difficulty identifying which of your local elected officials, if you didn't already know, were Democrats or Republicans. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, some of those offices are nonpartisan, so they don't have those. Uh, some of those office holders don't have those labels behind their name, like. Um, uh, some of the, the elected officials that we might be more familiar with. And I'd also say too, that there's a, there's a saying about local government that there's, there's no democratic or Republican way to pick up the trash or plow the streets, right? So you, uh, a lot of times that is where um, some more pragmatic thinking happens where it's about solving the problem at hand rather than getting dragged into the, uh, maybe the national swirl of politics, if you will. But at the same time, right, we can certainly find uh, examples of where local politics has uh, has gotten to the point where uh, what well, makes us want to look away. Typically, a crisis is really good for an incumbent. I, you don't have to answer this question, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask it. And if you're uncomfortable answering it, I totally get it. Um, is this crisis helping or hurting the governor? That's a good question. Um, I think it, it remains to be seen. Right. I think that. You know, we don't know where the um, where the end of this is, right? We're just we might be at the uh, end of the beginning, right? Rather than the beginning of the end. And and I, I'm no uh, epidemiologist or or doctor, so I, I can't tell you that. But you know, from a I guess from a political standpoint, uh, the governor's not up for re-election uh, for another couple of years, um, and so she's got a lot of time before she has to worry about facing the voters. Now that might change if she's on the uh, on the ticket with Vice Pre former Vice President Biden, um, but I I think that you know even if we think about the the political process say from from now until Election Day in November that's about five months which is as you know also is a is a is an eternity right it's a lifetime in politics. All right, I'll tell you one person. I'm going to answer my own question. I was going to ask you next, and then I'll I'll, I'll ask for your feedback. David Coulter, Oakland County Executive, you know, he coming in the heels of uh, legendary Albrecht Patterson, who was here forever. Um, Albrecht Patterson, Republican, David Coulter, former uh, mayor from Ferndale, Democrat. I would say this crisis has been extraordinarily good for David Coulter. Well, I, I, you make a really good point. And, and I think that that that's on the money. Um, not just for, for Dave Coulter, but for all incumbents who are on the ballot in 2020, it, certainly here in Michigan, right? I think uh, if you think about, um, say, Dave Coulter, he's got to get through the primary in August 1st, but, uh, and even folks like uh, Haley Stevens and Alyssa Slotkin, two members of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, members of the State House of Representatives, right? These folks are, are going to be campaigning after the August primary, uh, against folks who are uh, challengers, right, which is uh, a disadvantage to begin with, 
but those challengers are going to face additional hurdles, right? They they will have maybe more trouble. I would I would say with without a doubt more trouble uh, campaigning as they might like to, especially in down ballot races like state house where door to door campaigning is really important and is is a is a, 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 a hallmark of those kinds of campaigns. Challenger candidates are going to have a harder time raising money uh, to compete with those already well-funded incumbents, right? So I think that that all incumbents who are seeking re-election this year uh, have a distinct advantage, even more so than they than they do in in normal cycles. All right, and then uh, the the third um, group of people that we really should be talking about uh, right now is the people of the state of Michigan. And I'll tell you what, their voice has been heard on multiple issues louder and more effectively than I can remember in my lifetime going all the way back to the 60s when I was a little kid. Um, the, the protests that we saw even on COVID-19 before the whole Black Lives Matters uh, group of protests that are going on right now. Um, the people in the state of Michigan and across our country, but right here at home, have, have never spoken uh, more clearly and uh, as loud as they are right now. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and, and you make a good case that it's, it's on, on uh, issues across the spectrum, right? And, and across the policy, policy space. Uh, and, and that's a good thing, right? I think that that's a, a, the fact that more and more people are seeing that hey, maybe if I speak up, I can bring about some change that I'd like to see. Uh, that's a positive, right? And, and of course, we want, we want those uh, demonstrations and protests to happen in, in the right way and, and to do it in a, in a way that's um, respectful and, uh, and civil and, and productive, right? Um, rather than, than getting into uh, uh, destruction of property, et cetera, et cetera. David Dulio is our guest, professor of political science, Oakland University, and director of the Oakland University Center for Civic Engagement. This has been fun talking to you. I appreciate you taking time to chat with you. When when people ask me to speak in public in the rare times that that happens, I always like to talk about the evolution and the change in media uh, because it has been so dramatic in, in my career and lifetime. And, uh, you know, CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, we didn't have animals like that even five or 10 years ago to the degree that we do now. And uh, it's, it's fascinating, a fascinating time that we're living in. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to have plenty of fodder for your students when they return this fall. No doubt about it. There's, there's uh, always, uh, always stuff to talk about. All right. Well, thank you. Anything else you want to add before we say so long? No, if you're happy, I'm happy. All right. Very good. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. David Dulio joining us from Oakland University.